Yeah, so thank you all for coming. And uh, today I'll be talking about laconic zero knowledge to public key cryptography. This is joint work with Itai Berman, Ron Rathnum, and Prashant Nalini Vasudevan. Okay, so let's get started. Good. So public key encryption, we all love, know and love public key encryption. So it allows two people who have never met each other to communicate securely. In this case, Alice holds a secret key. There's a public key which is up in the sky. It allows Bob to send a message encrypted to Alice, such that any eavesdropper Eve who looks at this conversation cannot understand what the message is. Right? So public key encryption has been around for a while. It's extremely useful. At the same time, it's quite rare. So we know public key encryption constructions from a handful of uh, candidates, largely based on number theory and on lattices. So it's a very like it's a very important open question that we want to construct public key encryption from different kinds of assumptions, and uh, different in the sense that they look uh, qualitatively different from the kind of assumptions we know today. Okay, so in this talk, our goal is a bit different. So we want to understand what kind of structure or what kind of complexity theoretic structure implies public key encryption. So we, the goal is twofold. So first of all, we want to understand why is it that public key encryption is so rare, like that so few assumptions actually give us public key encryption. And the hope is that this kind of understanding will enable us to find other assumptions which give us public key encryption. Okay. So what kind of answers are we happy with? Good. So the best possible answer would be to say that NP hardness implies public key encryption. So if P is not equal to NP, then we have public key encryption. So unfortunately, this seems a bit too much to hope for. Today, we, do, we actually don't know any cryptography based on this worst case assumption. Also, there are some barriers known to achieving, uh, to constructing cryptography from these, uh, uh, from NP hardness alone. The next best thing we could hope for is to say that if one way functions exist, then public key encryption also exists. And uh, again, it seems like a fairly difficult problem. So let's look at something which seems more reasonable, which is to think of this class of uh, statistical zero knowledge problems. So I'll come to what it is in a minute. So there are a few things go this class has going for it. So first of all, we don't know any impossibility results for this class. Secondly, we know that it actually implies one way function. So any language which is in this class and is average case hard actually implies one way function. So that's good. And we also know that the many problems which imply public key encryption lie in this class. So um, it looks like a promising place to look. Let me remind you what the, the definition of this class. Okay. So it was defined by um, Shafi, Silvio, and Charlie Rakoff. It's an interactive proof. So there is a prover who is trying to prove that a certain instance is in the language. And it has the standard properties, which is that if the instance is actually in the language, then the prover succeeds in convincing the verifier that X is in the language. If X is not in the language, then cheating provers cannot convince a verifier that X is in the language. So the verifier would, with high probability, reject this uh, transcript. And here, this comes, soundness comes in two flavors. So we say that it's a proof if the prover is allowed to be computationally unbounded, while we would say that it's an argument if the prover is only allowed to be efficient. So which means that the prover can, in particular, not be a crypto. Okay. And zero knowledge. So usually, uh, we consider a notion of zero knowledge, which is secure against um, malicious verifiers. But in this talk, we would only need an honest verifier notion. So let me define that for you. So this is defined by the famous simulation paradigm. Uh, we say that a prover teach, we say that the verifier learns nothing if the verifier could have simulated this transcript completely by him, himself or herself. Informally, that there is a simulator says that this simulator outputs transcripts which are statistically close to transcripts of the real distribution. So here we actually want statistically close, not computationally indistinguishable, that these transcripts uh, have a distribution which is very similar to the actual one. Okay. So just a reminder, how big is this class? Right? So it's a relatively small class when compared to NP. It, it's bigger than P, but relatively small class. Interestingly, it, cons 
has many of the problems which give public key encryption, for example, LWE, quadratic reciprocity, and so on. Right. So um, can we construct public key encryption from statistical zero knowledge? And uh, it seems challenging. One key reason behind this is that um, SEK, the class also has problems like discrete log, which have been around for a really long time, and we still don't know public key encryption based on these problems. Okay, so can we impose more structure to actually get something? And to that end, let's look at an example. So let's consider quadratic non reciprocity And let me remind you what the problem is. So in this problem, the instance consists of a number n, which is a product of two primes, and the number y, which we have to answer, is it a square or not, modulo n. Okay. And this has a very nice uh, zero knowledge proof. What the verifier does is the following, that the verifier picks a square, multiplies it by y or not, and sends this across as the challenge. And what the prover has to answer is that is c a square or not. So if it was multi if the verifier actually multiplied y to the square, then this would not be a square. On the other hand, if the verifier did not, then this should be. So the prover replies back an answer which says, is this a square or not? And this can be done efficiently. Okay. So what are the properties of this? So this proof, uh, this proof system, by the way, is uh, very similar to the goldwasser mikali encryption scheme. So what are the properties this scheme has? So first of all, it's an honest verifier statistical zero knowledge proof. The verifier actually learns nothing here because all the verifier does is the verifier sends across a number knowing whether it's a square or not and gets back an answer which says the same thing. Secondly, we know that we can sample hard instances here. So you take two primes, multiply them together, and you get these instances. We know that the prover is efficient. So the prover, when given the factorization of uh, the integer n, can actually answer these queries efficiently. And finally, we know that the prover talks really little. Like the prover is only communicating one bit, which says, is it a square or not? OK, so in this paper, what we show is that these four properties are sufficient. That is, if you have a SEK proof system, which is uh, an honest verifier SEK proof or argument, it's uh, such that, first of all, the prover is efficient, and secondly, the prover talks little, along with um, a hard language, where you can sample, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, so along with a hard language, such that um, it has two distributions, a yes distribution and a no distribution, which samples instances in the language and not in the language. For the instances which are in the language, you sample them with a corresponding witness. So we show that if you have a language with both of these properties, then you can actually construct public key encryption from this. So a few points to note. So first of all, honest verifier is actually a weakening of the notion of zero knowledge. So it actually makes the result stronger, that you have to construct a weaker proof system than a full-fledged SEK argument. Secondly, argument is also weaker than a proof in the sense that you only have to achieve soundness against efficient provers. And uh, one point to note is that cryptographically hard language, like this notion of hardness is different from the usual notion of average case hardness. In the usual notion of average case hardness, what you want is that uh, there is one distribution which samples hard instances. You cannot tell if they're in the language or not. So here we are asking that these two be separate, like sampled separately. And in particular, this notion does imply one-way functions. So it should be hard to come up with the witness given the instance, and so this implies one-way functions. So what we show is that these uh, properties are sufficient to um, actually construct public encryption. Now what you should ask yourself is, uh, how reasonable is this? So there are two notions of what we could mean by reasonable. So first of all, what kind of assumptions are actually captured by this uh, characterization? And secondly, can you relax these conditions, primarily the conditions of efficient prover and uh, the Laconic proof system? So I'll come to both of these now. OK, so first of all, in terms of instantiation. So here's an exhaustive list of assumptions which are known to imply public key encryption. And um, so this assumption captures basically all the decision variance, decision assumptions here. 
it does not capture factoring and CDH, while it does capture, say, QR and LWE, and the assumptions which are given by Apple Bomber are like this. And uh, yeah, so it captures most of them. We don't actually know zero uh, SDK proofs for uh, factoring, and so that's a, Okay, so how about relaxing the assumptions, right? Like, so there are two key limitations here. The first one is that the prover has to be efficient. And uh, the second one is that the prover, in this proof system, the prover has to talk little. So here we are saying that the prover can only talk a sub-logarithmic number of bits. So how reasonable are these assumptions, right? So first of all, if we relax the efficient prover assumption, we know by this beautiful work of Sahai and Vadhan that it would imply that a ZK hardness implies public key encryption. So this happens because um, we know that all of statistical zero knowledge has a laconic uh, zero knowledge proofs, like proofs where the prover communicates only one bit. And uh, how about uh, relaxing the laconic condition, right? So first of all, if we can completely relax the laconic condition and have no restrictions placed whatsoever, then this actually implies one way function, uh, public key encryption from one way functions. And this is because all of NP has uh, these statistical zero knowledge arguments and uh, which are efficient prover. Even relaxing it to polylog for a fixed polylog would be fantastic. So it would, it would imply that exponentially hard one-way functions do imply public key encryption. So today what we know is that exponentially hard one-way functions imply Merkle puzzle style um, constructions which uh, have a security of about n squared. So this would imply full-fledged public key encryption, which is very far from what is known today. Okay, so what we saw is that uh, these two conditions together imply public key encryption. It turns out that public key encryption itself implies a weaker form of these, uh, this crypto system. So any public key encryption scheme implies uh, not a language, but rather a pair of distributions such that um, there is a yes distribution and a no distribution. The yes distribution has, um, uh, comes with a witness and also a zero knowledge proof system. So this proof system is not, uh, so it's weak because both completeness and soundness here hold on average. So they don't hold for every possible instance, but they hold on average for an instance sampled according to either the yes distribution or the no distribution. Okay. And you can go back. So once you have this assumption, you can actually, this assumption itself implies public key encryption. So this gives you a characterization of public key encryption in terms of a, a zero knowledge proof system. Okay. So to summarize till now, what we have seen is that a laconic efficient prover uh, on SOFR SDK arguments, give, uh, along with uh, the ability to sample hard instances, gives us public encryption. Okay. So in the remaining time I have, let me talk about uh, the kind of techniques which go into this result. So as a warm up, let's start with a two message deterministic uh, proof system. So what this means is that there's a prover and a verifier. The prover, the verifier is first going to send a challenge and then the prover is going to send back a response. At this point, the verifier would decide whether to accept or not. This response doesn't have to be a bit, like B seems to be confusing, but it can be longer. Um, okay, good. So how, and uh, since it's a zero knowledge proof, we have a simulator. The simulator is going to output um, simulated transcripts, which are denoted by the, the dash. Okay. So as a simplifying assumption, let's assume that we have perfect completeness and perfect zero knowledge. Both of these can be relaxed. Good. Okay, so just to point out that uh, this kind of a proof system is also known as a hash proof system. Okay. So how do we construct public key encryption from this? So let's start by constructing a weak key agreement protocol, and this can be amplified to a full-fledged public key encryption scheme. All right, so what Alice does is that Alice first samples a yes instance along with a witness, and she sends across the instance to Bob. Both, of, both Alice and Bob want to agree on um, something, and uh, at this point, what can the Bob do? So Bob only has the instance. Bob does not have a witness. 
So Bob can essentially run the simulator. And that's what Bob does. So Bob runs the simulator, and Bob generates a transcript. And from this transcript, sends back the verifier's challenge back to Alice. And outputs the prover's response as uh, the key Bob has agreed on. Now, Alice has something which Bob did not, which is the witness of this uh, instance. And so Alice uses that to run the prover. And at this point, Alice outputs the response given by the prover. Okay. So based from these two, what we want to show is that, uh, first of all, Alice and Bob actually agree. And second of all, we would like to show that this is actually secure. Good. So in terms of correctness, the first thing to observe is that because the prover is deterministic, the um, verifier's challenge actually fixes the response the prover is going to give. So every verifier's challenge has a unique response which would be given by the prover. Secondly, we know that because the zero knowledge is perfect, the simulator would also out be sampling from the same distribution as the original underlying distribution. So this tells us that the simulator output B prime would be the same as the original output B. Okay, how about security? Right, so we want to show that um, the adversary cannot predict this uh, message B prime with uh, probability more than say the soundness error. Okay. And so in this case, we would show this by contradiction. We would show that if this adversary could break uh, um, could actually predict it with high probability, we can use it to break average case hardness. We would do this by roughly treating the adversity as a cheating prover. So here's the distinguisher we would consider. So we have uh, the verifier, the verifier, and uh, the adversary taking the role of the prover. And now the verifier on input x runs the, runs, the, the distinguisher runs the verifier, gets the first message, feeds it to the adversary, sees the response, and sees if this would be accepted or not. Okay. And um, so if x is actually in the language, then by our assumption that this adversary is violating security, uh, this should be accepted, because the original prover's response was going to be accepted. And so then the uh, distinguisher would output yes with probability more than the sum error. On the other hand, for an instance which is not in the language, by the property, by soundness, you know that it's going to be accepted by a prob uh, probability which is less than this value. And this gives us a contradiction. So this is a weak public, weak key agreement protocol, and this can be amplified to a full-fledged PKE using uh, this work of Hollenstein and Reynolds. Okay. So now we have made, so this was a warm up, so we have made a couple of simplifying assumptions here which we would like to remove. And uh, the assumptions were the following, right? So first of all, we assumed that the prover was deterministic. We would like to handle randomized provers. Second of all, this was a two message uh, encryption, uh, two message system, we would like to handle many rounds. And this introduces an additional challenge, that in this case, the prover had no state. All I needed to run this prover was take the next message, uh, run the prover, you get something. On the other hand, now to run a prover which acts for many rounds, this prover can keep state, and somehow we need a way to handle this uh, issue. Okay. There are some other challenges, like relaxing these conditions, but those we'll ignore for now. Okay. So now, let's see how do we deal with randomized provers. So this is the scheme we had earlier, right? Like Alice uh, sent across the instance, uh, got back a verifi verifier's challenge as the next message, and both of them output uh, the prover's response as generated in two different ways. So what happens to this? So first of all, the security still is fine. Like nothing in the proof was affected here. But on the other hand, correctness here uh, doesn't actually go through. The reason is the prover is now randomized, so there are multiple responses this prover could have given. And now the probability that both of these responses would be the same is actually low. Good. So the way we handle these uh, issues, now I realize I won't have a lot of time to talk about it. The way we handle these issues is we come up with an abstraction, which is a weaker notion of, uh, um, so here we would relax uh, the public key encryption notion in two significant ways. First of all, 
a ciphertext in this notion is not bound to a fixed bit, but rather bound to a distribution of messages. And secondly, the adversary here, the, mes the underlying message is not completely hidden from the adversary, but rather uh, only weakly so. Okay, so I'll actually skip this. Yeah, I, I'll actually skip this, good. So, um, right, so the two the main differences here are that the uh, public ciphertext does not actually fix the message, and secondly, for an adversary, the adversary has only a weak notion of unpredictability. That, so we formalize this using pseudo-entropy. So now there are uh, two steps which we have to talk about, which is how do you go from this assumption to, uh, from SEK hardness to trapdoor pseudo-entropy generators, and secondly, from trapdoor pseudo-entropy generators to public encryption. And uh, actually, since I'm running out of time, I'll not talk a lot about it. So first of all, here you, uh, this part basically abstracts out the SEK proof system, and you are left with um, this notion. So there are two challenges you have to handle. The first challenge is that you have many, many rounds. <laughs> And in this case, the way it's handled is how Ostrovsky constructs a one-way function, which is you run the simulator and you terminate at a random round. And uh, the stateful prover we cannot handle completely generically. This does require that the proof system is laconic, in which case we do some notion of rejection sampling. And uh, the second half is an amplification theorem. So you have this weak notion of public key encryption, and from here we want to go to the full fresh public key encryption scheme. This is actually the technically more difficult half. Now you, what you have to do is you have to exploit these connections which are known between pseudo-randomness and unpredictability. And uh, primarily the constructions of uh, pseudo-random generators from one-way functions. And uh, okay. So, okay, let me actually conclude. So here we have, uh, what we showed is that laconic efficient prover honest verifier ZK arguments um, imply public key encryption. And uh, a big open question is, can we use this to design new public encryptions? Okay, with that, I'll take questions. 